Good evening, Tributes, and welcome back to Tales of the Hunger Games. I hope that everyone is well, and that you have had a dazzling week wherever you are. Before we begin, I'd like to give my usual thanks to the fabulous Andrew McLean for all the art that he has produced for this series, as well as my Patreons for their continued financial pledge. It is much appreciated. I'm also going to mention the Tales of the Hunger Games Discord, where pretty much everything to do with this series is discussed, as well as the general Hunger Games Discord, and there is going to be a big announcement about the upcoming reaping for this Discord at the end of this video, so make sure you stick around for that. The links for these two Discords, as well as plenty of other links to do with this series, can be found below in the description, so feel free to browse around there, but be careful of the comments as well. So, without further ado, let's go. Following the short yet dramatic games of District 2, many capital citizens spent the next few days voicing their anticipation for the upcoming games of District 1, with some former victors and senior figures from District 2 joking that their rival career district would be incapable of producing games that were as exciting as theirs. Like District 2, the usual reaping process was conducted differently in District 1, in which the volunteers performed a chosen skill before being voted upon by the local population to see which five male and five female volunteers would go through to the next round. The mayor would then ask these volunteers questions about the games, their skills, and themselves in general, before the local population would vote once more for this year's male and female tribute. On the Sunday before the reaping day, Mayor Braun addressed the population of Penem and announced that after talks with advisors, she had decided that the volunteer process would be similar for this year. Braun mentioned that 19 male and 17 female youths had volunteered for the 16 places in these games, which triggered applause within Snow Square, although Rubius Dalton, victor of the 86th Hunger Games, asked, is that it? Braun then stated that the volunteers would display a chosen skill as usual, followed by just one round of voting, and the eight male and eight female volunteers that received the most votes would earn the 16 places of tributes in these games. She continued that the volunteers' talent displays would be broadcast from dawn the next day, and upon hearing this news, many viewers in Snow Square quickly made plans to spend the night here, in order to maintain a good spot for watching the square's screen the next morning. It is also worth noting that due to the discovery of an unidentified strain of measles within the capital a few days earlier, concerns were raised about the amount of viewers that were gathered in Snow Square, but President Gaul insisted that the usual festivities must go ahead as planned. The displays of District 1's tributes began early the next morning, although many of the district's residents had long been awake, in order to have decent seats within the display square. Mayor Braun welcomed the excited crowds, and stated that the displays of the 17 female volunteers would soon begin, then be followed by the displays of the 19 male volunteers, before the voting hour that would occur around midday. The first few female displays got underway, and as usual, viewers in Snowscare were amazed with what they were seeing. Eugenia Ravenstill also noted that many of the girls seemed to have made an extra effort with their appearance this year, to which Rubius responded that they would likely do anything to stand out. The fifth display was announced to be that of 18-year-old Charmers Angstrom, and a very muscular young lady with short pink spikes for hair entered the display square. As she came into view, Rubius immediately commented that she was quite an unusual sight, but Eugenia jokingly replied that Rubius should hope Charmers did not hear this, or she could flatten him, to which Rubius laughed and agreed, before pretending to seal his lips. Charmers then began her display, in which she brutally beat a training dummy with incredible force, and as the crowd cheered on in surprise, she continued to bash the dummy so hard that it started to fall apart, and by the end of her allocated two minutes, its lower half had broken off to the ground. When the display ended, the crowd cheered, but Charmers remained still and looked back at them with little to no expression, until Mayor Braun re-entered the square and dismissed Charmers, even quivering slightly as she walked past. Five more well-presented young women put on a variety of displays, then it was the turn of 18-year-old Dazzle Mortello. As she entered the square, her name proved to be appropriate, with many viewers in Snow Square remarking and even gasping upon seeing her radiant blonde locks and bright blue eyes. Dazzle announced that she would be throwing axes for her chosen skill, which seemed to cause some surprise to the crowd, and she was in fact the only volunteer of either gender to choose this skill, 
which Eugenia stated would likely play to her advantage. Over the next two minutes, she threw axes of a variety of lengths, sizes, and materials into several targets, hitting only centimetres at most from their central sections, which triggered cheers within the surrounding crowds and Snow Square itself. As Dazzle was leaving the square after this display, she looked back to the camera and smiled, to which Rubius commented that he would eat his hat if she did not receive a place in the games. She was then followed by four more young ladies, but none of them seemed to attract the same level of cheer. The penultimate female volunteer was then announced by Mayor Braun to be 17-year-old Plush Malone, and a smiling young lady with a frizzy, unkept bob of red hair walked into the square. Many cheers from youths of Plush's age erupted throughout the crowd, and Eugenia commented that she seemed popular, which would likely play in her favour, although the support was quickly silenced by peacekeepers. Plush announced that she would be throwing knives, but this was not met with much anticipation, possibly due to many other volunteers having shown this skill. However, within 30 seconds of Plush's display, she had performed several flips and stands on various parts of her body, whilst throwing these knives, which soon created much more applause and cheers than Eugenia and Rubius appeared to have expected. In fact, as the display went on, Plush's accuracy with the knives improved even further, and after ending the display on a 10 second long series of backflips, she was met with rampant applause from the surrounding crowd and Snow Square alike, before smiling courteously as she left the square. After the unforgettable final female display of Sapphire Jones, there was a short interval, during which time many citizens of District 1 stretched their legs and allegedly discussed how they may be tempted to vote, even though it was technically illegal to do so. After 20 minutes, the interval ended, and the crowds were ushered back into the display square in order to watch the male volunteers. Several displays of pure strength and showmanship ensued, until it was announced to be the turn of 17-year-old Patent Carter, and a young man with slick black hair, and a still face entered the square. Viewers appeared surprised by the amount of rings covering Patent's ears and hands, with Rubius joking that he was more metal than human. Patent began to fire arrows in quick succession at a range of moving targets, which he did without even moving his eyes from these targets, to cheers from the crowd. At one point, a young boy even ran into the square, after having been told off by his mother, but Patent ignored him and continued shooting at the targets, missing the boy by inches and finishing his display without hesitation. Mayor Braun shouted at Peyton to stop, but peacekeepers quickly retrieved the boy, and the display continued until the end of the two minutes. Most of the crowd then applauded, and Eugenia joked that one could not fault Peyton's determination. A few more displays occurred, until that of 18-year-old Scabble Forex, and a young man with olive skin and dark choppy hair entered the square, whilst Eugenia immediately commented on how much she appreciated his physique, with many viewers also admiring his scarlet tank top and tight back shorts. Scabble opted to fence against a peacekeeper, and as he was dressed in the relevant pads, a peacekeeper was brought out, then Mayor Braun handed them each a sword. The fight was indeed exciting for all viewers, although it soon became obvious that Scabble had the upper hand, easily blocking the peacekeeper's swipes and marking his own in a repetitive cycle, which saw him win after the two minutes with 13 points to one. Amidst rampant cheers from the audience, Scabble bowed and left the square. The following displays saw a variety of weapons and skills being utilised by the next male volunteers, until there was only one remaining. Mayor Braun proudly announced this final volunteer to be her son, 18-year-old Optimo Braun, with some viewers allegedly suspicious that he had been placed at random into the coveted final spot, but his display went ahead as planned. A slim young man with carefully coiffed brown hair then entered the square, and some viewers present even scoffed as he removed his scarlet tracksuit. However, this sound was quickly stopped by peacekeepers, and Optimo announced that he would be throwing spears. He proceeded to do this with a surprisingly high level of power and accuracy, whilst not appearing to sense any difficulty when the targets began to move in front of him, and Mayor Braun was noted to be beaming with apparent pride. The midday rest followed this display, in which the citizens of District 1 were able to vote for their favourite displays and eat their lunchtime meal, which included one bread roll and a stick of cheese that had been kindly provided by the capital. Many voters allegedly struggled with the two choices that they had to make, but the process was eventually completed after a brief delay, and the citizens returned to the square for the results. Once all volunteers had been lined up, a peacekeeper entered the square with a sealed envelope containing the results, which he handed to Mayor Braun, and she carefully looked over these results for the next minute. 
She then announced the first placing female tribute to be Sapphire Jones, aged 18, who had used weapons to slice off her clothes before aiming at the targets, which appeared to have worked in enticing votes. Braun also announced that Rock Fortescue, aged 18, was the first placing male tribute, and Eugenia had joked during Rock's display that due to his extremely muscular build, his name was indeed rather apt. Sapphire and Rock were cheered as they stepped forward with elated grins. They approached Mayor Braun's platform and shook her hand, then each other's, before being escorted from the square by peacekeepers, amidst more cheers from the crowd. They were subsequently driven to the nearby station and placed on the first carriage of the train, that detached from the rest of the train and took only ten minutes to reach the capital. The second placing pair were then announced to be Resina Mintis, aged 18, whom Rubia stated to have petrifying eyes when she glared at her targets, along with Miracle Rosinski, aged 18, who had let out a series of primal roars whenever he threw a spear, which had made the crowd laugh, although his accuracy could not be mocked. The third placing pair was revealed to be Shamers and Optimo, who seemed to eye each other with some suspicion as they walked towards Mayor Braun. However, she congratulated them both, whilst looking very proudly to Optimo, who smiled back to her. Braun then whispered something to him, before ushering both tributes towards the next set of peacekeepers, who escorted them through the square to the sound of more cheers. Amethyst Desai, aged 17, was announced to be the fourth placing female tribute, thanks to her lightning knife throwing display. She was joined by Lord Harrison, aged 17, who had stunned the crowd with how aggressively he fought against the peacekeeper, even hitting his helmet with the sword on two separate occasions during this fight. The next pair were revealed to be Plush and Scabble, and whilst they smiled and walked towards each other, Eugenia stated that there was definitely some chemistry. They shook hands with Mayor Braun, but as they shook each other's hands, Scabble winked and Plush giggled quietly. Once they had left the square, it was announced that Opulenza Rivalta, aged 18, who had captivated the audience by marking targets with her own blood, was the sixth placing female tribute, whilst Denim Townsend, aged 18, whose archery display was probably the most accurate so far, had been voted as the sixth placing male tribute. Yet when the pair walked towards each other, Denim snarled, and Opulenza glumly looked away, whilst Rubius laughed and commented that they were clearly unhappy to be placed together. The seventh placing pair were then announced as Dazzle and Patent, but whilst Dazzle smiled to Patent, he looked towards the crowd instead, and Rubius joked that he seemed to be waiting for further applause. After eventually shaking hands with each other, they were escorted from the square, and an air of tension took over the crowd and volunteers alike, as it became clear that only two more of the 22 volunteers would be reaped for the games. Mayor Braun remained quiet for a while, before announcing that Bounty Backrock, aged 18, had been selected as the final female tribute, and as she smiled and marched forwards, Rubius said the Scarlet Girl in relation to the bright shade that Brownty had dyed her hair, as well as the colour of her scant outfit. She was joined by Graf Ferens, aged 17, which surprised some viewers, especially given that he had asked the audience to be quiet when he was getting ready to throw spears during his display. Once Bounty and Graf had left the square, most of the remaining volunteers were clearly disappointed that they had not received enough votes to enter the games, but Mayor Braun prompted the audience to applaud these volunteers, which was done with cheer. The volunteers and the audience were then dismissed from the square, and Eugenia and Rubius began an in-depth analysis of the 16 tributes, as well as their displays and pairing dynamics. The journey to the capital only lasted 11 minutes, and before the final pair had even been announced, the carriages containing some tributes were already halfway to the capital. In carriage C were Optimo and Charmeurs, who began the journey by watching Capital TV on the screen, but when Rubius began to talk about Sapphire's slender physique, Sharmas snarled and seemed irritated. She then got up from the sofa and headed towards the dummy in the corner of the carriage, which she punched with enough force to knock it back against the wall. Meanwhile, Optimo seemed relaxed, and mainly ignored Sharmas during this time, whilst focusing more on what Rubius was saying about Rock. After a few more minutes, Sharmas came back to the sofa and looked surprised, appearing to tell Optimo that he looked very relaxed. However, he turned around and seemed to state that he could afford to rest for a while, which surprised Sharmers even more as he turned back towards the screen. Meanwhile, in carriage E, Scabble and Plush had begun the journey by watching the same footage on Capital TV. Yet as the focus shifted from Rock to Racina, the pair moved closer on the sofa to each other, and they appeared to be talking seductively, before kissing and becoming intimate with each other. Scabble and Plush even began to disrobe towards the end of their journey, until an announcement was made on the speaker system to remind them that they would arrive in the capital within a few minutes, 
and that they should be fully dressed for the occasion. This caused Plush to panic and quickly button her dress once more, while Scabble looked around in confusion, presumably for the hidden cameras inside this carriage. Meanwhile in carriage G, Dazzle watched Capital TV and appeared to listen carefully to what Rubius and Eugenia were saying about Miracle's display, whilst Patent stood by the window and stared out at the rocky desert through which they were travelling. Dazzle appeared to try speaking to Patent about what was being shown on the screen, but he was clearly uninterested in talking to her. He continued to look ahead from the carriage's window, and so Dazzle soon abandoned her efforts to communicate with him. When each pair of tributes arrived in Snow Station, they were greeted by Mirai Kobayashi, victor of the 94th Hunger Games, and Dolla Crusoe, victor of the 95th Hunger Games, who led them to the limousines at the front of the station. Mirai was very complimentary towards Sharma's display, and stated that it was about time District 1 provided a strong female fighter once more, whilst Dola irritated Optimo by saying that his mother was the most attractive mare the District had seen in a while, before quickly stating that he was joking, although Optimo no longer appeared interested in listening to Dola after hearing this opinion. As for Plush and Scabble, Mirai took the former aside as they walked through the station, and reminded her that although an alliance with Scabble would be a good idea, she should be careful about forming too much of an attachment with him. Plush looked at Mirai with apparent confusion, but she responded that she had seen what happened on the train. Meanwhile, Dolla was allegedly encouraging Scabble to continue this relationship, and he appeared amused as Dolla spoke about how he could charm Plush into an alliance. When Dazzle and Patent entered the station ten minutes later, Mirai complimented the former for her strong display. Yet as the women looked back to see Dollar unsuccessfully trying to make conversation with Patent, Mirai whispered that Dazzle should look elsewhere for an ally, to which she smiled and nodded back in apparent agreement. Once each pair had arrived in the accommodation tower, they were allocated to apartments according to their placement in the voting, similarly to how they were allocated to each train carriage. This therefore saw Optimo and Sharmers being escorted to apartment 3, while Scabble and Plush were escorted to apartment 5, and Patent and Dazzle were escorted to apartment 7. Optimo spent the afternoon watching the analysis on Capital TV, whilst making notes on the strengths and weaknesses of each of his fellow tributes. Sharmers also watched the screen for most of the afternoon, but following the harsh critiques of her outfit from Agnes Anderson, lead editor of Anderson Fashion, she moved to her bedroom and appeared to be upset. Sharmers then dressed herself in one of the white gowns from the wardrobe, before placing an elegant blonde wig over her short spikes, and applying a range of makeup to her face. She did indeed look extremely different, but as she looked into the mirror, she breathed deeply and punched her reflection with so much power that a crack formed on the glass. Meanwhile, Scabble and Plush had immediately engaged in intimate acts within just minutes of entering apartment 5. Over the afternoon, they moved between Plush's bedroom and the main room, where they watched Capital TV and discussed the other tributes until they felt intimate again, at which point they would return to Plush's bedroom, in a repetitive cycle that lasted until dusk. As for the events in apartment 7, Dazzle convinced Patent to watch Capital TV with her, and he began to give some observations regarding the other tributes. However, after just one hour, Patent locked himself in his bedroom, and excitedly dressed in all the robes, suits and dresses that he could find. Dazzle appeared to hear Patent's excitement from within the main room, and soon after Agnes Anderson's review began, she sighed and turned off the screen, before heading to the balcony. Dazzle rested in the sun for a while, but soon appeared amused as she listened to the apartment occurring in the apartment below between Opulenza and Denim, that revolved around a recent incident at a diamond processing plant where they both used to work. Unfortunately, there were power outages throughout the capital that evening, whilst the accommodation tower's generator malfunctioned for unknown reasons which stops us from knowing what happened when Dollar and Mirai came to visit the apartments later that evening. However, we can assume that they spoke to the tributes about the training the next day, as well as their potential threats and strategies for the upcoming games. Early the next morning, all 16 tributes were taken down to the training centre, where Dollar and Mirai were already waiting in the mentoring gallery. The tributes were briefed by Rubius Dalton, who reminded them that any unruly behaviour would be punished which was met with the sounds of the training staff's tasers as Rubius said this final word. The tributes then moved to their preferred stations, and Rubius ascended the stairs to the mentoring gallery. After a brief discussion together, Scabble approached the fencing station, whilst Plush approached the adjacent knife-throwing station. They kept a close eye on each other for the next hour as they practiced, until Scabble was joined by Lord Harrison, who asked a fence against him, 
and as he looked at Plush, she nodded back. Scabble was subsequently beaten by Lord with seven points to five, but as Dollar watched from the mentoring gallery, he was heard saying that both boys had fought well. During this fight, Plush continued in the knife-throwing station, where she appeared to dodge many imagined projectiles that flew back towards her. However, she too was approached soon after, this time by Amethyst Asai, who also used this station, whilst watching Plush very carefully as she did so. But Plush continued to focus on the targets ahead, and Amethyst's presence did not seem to faze her. Once Scabble had completed his fight against Lord, Plush came back to speak to him, and the pair looked ready to move to the archery station, but they were soon approached by Optimo, who had just been improving his skills even further in the spear-throwing station. Scabble immediately said that he was not interested in fighting, and that he wanted some time to speak to Plush in private, but Optimo responded that he was not looking to fight with either of them, and that he was simply impressed by what he had seen of them so far. Plush then seemed to listen as Optimo gestured towards some of the other tributes practicing, before quietly suggesting an alliance between the three of them and Sharmers. Scabble looked over in surprise to see Sharmers gaining the upper hand as she fought against Rock Fortescue in the sparring station. He asked Optimo if she would also be interested in this alliance, to which he responded that he would try to convince her. However, as the boys spoke, Plush looked at Amethyst's lightning speed in the knife-throwing station, then towards Bounty Backrock and Graf Ferens, who had just broken their gender records in the Endurance Station. Plush turned back to Optimo and whispered that an alliance would be welcome, which appeared to surprise Scabble, but he did not object. Meanwhile, Charmeuse had initially practiced in the Strength Station, where she held a weight bar that had heavier and heavier weights placed upon its size by a member of training staff over the first hour. This appeared to impress many other tributes, although Rosina Mentis was noted to watch in bewilderment from next to the Sparring Station, before attracting the attention of Miracle Rosinski, who had just finished fighting Rock in the sparring station. As Miracle began to watch Sharmers lifting more than 100 kilograms, Rock looked over in intrigue. Sharmers then rested, and Rock approached her, asking if she would fight against Miracle in the sparring station. However, to Rock's surprise, Sharmers asked why he did not want to fight against her himself. He grinned, but Sharmers walked over to Miracle, and asked why Rock had asked him to fight her, which appeared to confuse Miracle whilst Rock pleaded with him that he had been joking. Yet Charmeuse then entered the sparring station and asked Rock to join her, before grinning and beckoning him, whilst Miracle, Racina, and Sapphire watched in anticipation and amusement. Over the following five minutes, almost all tributes began to watch Charmeuse and Rock viciously fighting against each other, and although Rock initially gained the upper hand, Charmeuse valiantly held her own and managed to defend herself. However, towards the end of the fight, Rock was clearly beginning to lose any energy that he had remaining, and Shamers fought harder, even pushing him against the wall on several occasions, before holding him in a headlock, which saw the peacekeepers quickly ending the fight, most likely in order to stop Shamers from causing too much harm to Rock. He appeared to be humiliated for the rest of the morning, with Rosina and Miracle both making jokes at his expense about setting Shamers upon him. She kept a low profile, and practiced in the endurance station for most of the remaining time with Bounty and Graf, who appeared to congratulate her for her fight against Rock. As for Patent, he had started the morning in the archery station, where he was soon joined by Denim Townsend, and it later emerged that the boys had built a strong friendship from their time together at the Townsend Academy. For the first half of the morning, they routinely shot arrows at various moving targets, whilst discussing the other tributes, with Denim spending most of the time complaining about having to share an apartment with Opulenza Revelta, which initially appeared to amuse Patent. After witnessing the fight between Rock and Sharmers, Peyton chose to move to the obstacle course, but he gradually appeared annoyed as Denim followed him and continued to complain about Opulenza, who was now watching them from the aquatic station. Peyton then started the obstacle course and completely ignored Denim as he followed him through the course. Peyton even surprised several tributes, including Sapphire and Amethyst, with his rapid speed through the course, especially for his smaller height although Denim was sneered at by Opulenza when he fell from one of the climbing walls and landed painfully on his back. As the morning went on, Patent continued in the station, without even looking at any other tributes. It was also noticed by Mirai towards the end of the morning that as he left the obstacle course, he walked past Denim, who had just cut himself in the knife-throwing station, without offering any help. Dollar was then heard to reply that they may not be such good friends after all. As for Dazzle, she started the morning by heading to the obstacle course, and initially performing rather well, especially upon the climbing wall, which she scaled extremely quickly. 
However, it was noticed by Mirai that when she was beginning to attract the attention of Sapphire and Amethyst, she appeared to be deliberately slowing her speed and even having trouble with various obstacles. Yet when these girls looked away from Dazzle, she increased her speed once more. During the fight between Rock and Charmeuse, she was one of the few tributes to not spectate, but instead moved herself to the camouflage station, where she quickly covered herself in foliage and ivy, before painting her face into a dark green background. Dazzle then spent the second half of the morning inconspicuously looking out at the other tributes, whilst trying not to laugh at Sapphire and Amethyst's jokes about Rock, which were clearly annoying him. Towards the end of the morning, Dollar spotted Dazzle changing her focus towards Scabble, Plush and Optimo, who were now practicing together in the knife throwing station. Yet during the final hour of practice, Dazzle appeared most observant of the dynamic between Plush and Scabble, which was becoming more intimate as the time went on, with Scabble even appearing to console Plush towards the end of the training time. Once the training had finished, the exhausted tributes headed back to the accommodation tower, where they were bathed, groomed, and dressed in scarlet suits, dresses, and accessories by Pixie the stylist and the rest of her Avox team. Meanwhile, the Dalton Studios were being decorated with a bright scarlet lighting system, along with elaborate architecture across its stage, and luxurious diamond chandeliers that were synonymous with the produce of District 1. However, as the proceedings began, it soon became clear that Rubius was heavily inebriated, and he openly yawned when Eugenia introduced him and Artulia to the audience. The interviews got underway, and Sapphire was made to cry from Rubius' comments about her dress, although he surprised many viewers by scoring Rock and 8. Yet after Rosina's knife-throwing display, Rubius returned to form by stating that she had bored him before scoring Miracle a 5, for simply dropping an arrow halfway through his otherwise outstanding archery display. The next display was that of Charmeurs, who came to the stage in a scarlet suit, and after walking the runway, Eugenia complimented her for the matching scarlet colour of her short spiky hair, but Rubius interrupted by bursting into laughter, which triggered amusement from the audience. Artulia then tried to keep the proceedings going by asking Charmeurs what she would like to show for her chosen skill, to which she replied that she was going to show her strength, but that she was now more tempted to fight Rubius, if he felt brave enough. Although Rubius quickly refused, the audience cheered him on, and he eventually joined Charmeurs on the runway. The following fight was one of the most surreal talent displays that was seen all year, and Rubius soon gained the upper hand and knocked Charmeurs against the floor on several occasions, but she still managed to get in some punches and even held Rubius down against the floor towards the end of this fight, amidst chaotic cheers within the audience. As peacekeepers ended this fight in a hurry, Rubius was noted to grin, and he shook Charmeurs' hand. Then once the audience were quiet again, she turned towards them and infamously stated, this ain't no beauty contest. After this shocking display, a very brief question and answer round occurred, followed by the judges' scores, which were revealed to be 7-8-6, according to the judgement of Eugenia, Rubius and Artulia, which gave Charmeurs an overall score of 7. It was then the turn of Optimo, who came to the stage in a burgundy suit with ruby-encrusted lapels that seemed to fit him very well, both physically and psychologically. After a brief snort from Rubius, Optimo began a spear-throwing display, with his power and accuracy appearing to impress the crowd. Although Artulia later stated that she would have liked to see a more exciting display than what they had seen during the reaping the day before. Optimo's questioning was led by Eugenia, and he gave some decent answers regarding past hazards that had occurred within the games, as well as how he would survive them. Yet when Artulia asked Optimo why he was more likely to win over the other male tributes, he responded that tributes from his family had often done well in these games. He was about to continue, but Rubius interrupted that one creates one's own merit, and the silence fell over the stage, until Rubius nonchalantly said that it was time to give the scores, and Optimo received 767, which gave him an overall score of 7. The next interviews were those of Amethyst and Lord, who were both clearly annoyed to receive scores of 7, but not 8. Following them was Plush, who seemed slightly distracted and distant as she came to the stage in a flowing red dress that Eugenia later compared to a blossoming rose. However, Plush soon regained her composure and performed a strong knife-throwing display that featured even more acrobatic twists than her reaping display, although Rubius appeared to be reading a copy of Anderson Fashion during this time. Plush's questioning started well, and she answered many questions with apparent ease, but as the focus of the conversation turned towards alliances with other tributes, she became tense. Rubius then asked if Plush thought she would be willing to kill Scabble if they were together in the grand final, and as she appeared to be thinking deeply, 
he added that they could maybe find time to discuss this during their next train journey before winking and grinning. Plush gulped and seemed to struggle, but as Ruby's smile widened, she replied that her strong friendship with Scabble would help their chances in the games and not hinder them, which earned applause from the audience members, and Plush seemed relieved as she nervously looked down. She was subsequently scored 7-6-7, seven, seven, which gave her an overall score of 7, and she left the stage before she had even been dismissed. Opulenza and Denim's rather jarring interviews followed, then it was the turn of Dazzle, who came to the stage in a calm and demure manner, despite being adorned in a stunning scarlet gown that featured hems coated in sparkling ruby jewels, whilst more of these jewels were also braided in flowing lines through her blonde curls. After graciously accepting some compliments from Eugenia, Dazzle announced that she would be throwing axes for her chosen skill, but whilst most of the peacekeepers carried axes and targets to the stage, one of them tied a blindfold around Dazzle's eyes. Controversial murmurs flowed through the audience, and Rubius finally appeared to pay attention as Dazzle was handed an axe. She then turned her head towards the targets, while some of the audience even shielded themselves, but there was no need to, as Dazzle soon shocked them with the accuracy of her shots, which hit the very middle of most targets, despite her inability to see, and once her display had ended, many of the audience were on their feet and applauding. Dazzle removed the blindfold and curtsied, before returning to the centre of the stage for the questioning. She proceeded to do rather well with most of her answers, but she stuttered a little when Rubius asked why she had not interacted with any male tributes during the training earlier that day. Dazzle waited a little, before replying that she hoped that her display this evening would entice them to interact with her, and this triggered applause from the audience. She then scored 778, which gave her an overall score of 7, and she seemed pleased, yet also somewhat relieved as she left the stage. It was then the interview of Patent, who wore a bright red suit over his body, but matching ruby studs and rings over his ears and hands respectively, which caused Rubius to glare at him in disbelief as he walked the runway. Patent then performed an archery display that was strong, yet similar to what he had shown the day before, and Rubius soon appeared to shift his attention to the magazine once more. Patent's questioning followed, and he began well, but Eugenius soon seemed to become bored as he proceeded to recite his long list of achievements at the Richland Academy. Furthermore, Patent's lack of expression and quiet voice also appeared to bore the audience, many of whom looked towards the decorations around the studios during this time. Patent then scored 657, which only scored him a 6 overall, but unlike District 2, several of District 1's tributes had also received the score. Bounty and Griff received overall scores of 6 as well, mainly due to Rubius's lack of interest in their interviews, which led him to score them 4 and 5 respectively. Early the next morning, the 16 tributes were flown to the arena, where they were escorted into their individual holding rooms. They were then ordered to dress in the scarlet lycra suits that were provided, and for the next hour, most tributes prepared themselves by stretching, pacing around the room, and breathing deeply. During this time, Dollar visited each of the male tributes, whilst Mirai visited their female counterparts. Dollar appeared stoic as he left the final male holding room, although as he spotted Mirai in the corridor, she nodded in reassurance. The pair were then escorted by peacekeepers to the viewing gallery, and they watched in anticipation as the order was finally given for tributes to enter their tubes. They waited suspensefully in their tubes for one more minute, until the podiums rose into the cornucopia cave. District 1's games took place in an arena known as the Diamond Lakes. This arena formed a perfect circle, and with a radius of approximately one kilometre, it was slightly smaller than most other arenas from this year. Furthermore, over 99% of the arena's terrain lay within caves, which therefore limited its area in terms of height. This arena was comprised of hundreds of caves of various shapes and sizes, all of which contained arches on each of their sides that enabled tributes to pass with ease between caves. There were also many lakes throughout the arena, and although they varied in size and depth, they all contained clear glistening water that Eugenia announced to the surprise of many to be safe to drink. Also scattered over this arena were thousands of bright sparkling diamonds that were each tainted with a different colour. Many of these diamonds were encrusted within hard rocks that were approximately the size of a newborn child, while some were scattered across the roofs of the caves, which lit the areas beneath. 
Eugenia began the tour of the arena within the central area that she dubbed the Inner Zone, where most of the caves were covered in large lakes, with a few paths of dry rocky ground that one could use to pass between them, as well as several diamond rocks that were scattered throughout these caves. Yet as one travelled further from the Inner Zone, and into the Middle Zone, the height of the cave's roofs gradually increased, whilst the quantity and size of the lakes decreased. Instead, there were many diamond rocks scattered along the ground, as well as more diamonds attached to the roofs. Beyond this middle section of the arena was the outer zone, which contained fewer diamond rocks and lakes. However, the height of the caves increased to the point that some roofs contained large holes that allowed light to enter. These holes in the ceiling were dubbed light holes by Eugenia, and as they were inspected more closely, Rubius remarked that tributes would likely be able to climb the rocky walls of these holes, although they would need to pay attention to the perimeter that lay just 10 meters above the ground of most of the light holes. The cornucopia lay in a large circular cave of roughly 100 meters in radius that was positioned in the very center of the arena. The ground of this cave was covered in a lake, although its water became shallower towards the center of the cave, where a circular island of just over 15 meters in radius was positioned. The ground within this island rose as it moved from the water until it reached a central platform of roughly 5 metres in radius. There was also a large hole in the cave ceiling that lay directly above this platform, which illuminated the ground below, as well as the rest of the cave. The 16 podiums formed a complete circle around the edge of this cave, and it was noticed by Rubius that eight small arches were positioned along the cave's wall, between each pair of podiums. Rubius then examined the rest of the Cornucopia Cave, and he noticed that eight pickaxes, which were traditionally used to dislodge diamonds from rocks, were placed equidistantly around the edge of the central platform. However, he added that tributes would have no way of knowing at this time that despite the axe's strong wooden shafts and sharp metal blades, the catches that connected these two parts of the axe were in fact extremely weak, meaning that the shaft and blade could detach relatively easily. As the podiums rose into the arena, Many tributes were clearly phased by the bright light within this cave, as well as the light produced by the luminous diamonds on the cave's roof. Yet as they looked around, many tributes also appeared relieved to recognise this setting that was at least somewhat familiar to their district. Once tributes' eyes seemed to have become accustomed to the light, President Gould wished that the odds be in their favour, before starting the countdown from 30 seconds. Soon after, the camera showed Sharmers, who was stood on a western podium between Rock and Scabal. However, unlike most other tributes, she did not even glance towards her neighbouring tributes, but stared intently towards the axes ahead. Dazzle was placed on an eastern podium on the other side of the cave. At first she was looking straight towards the central island, but as the countdown progressed, she gradually looked upwards and around, presumably at the diamonds on the roof. In fact, as Miracle and Lord were flexing on the podiums either side of Dazzle and appearing ready to dive inwards, she continued to look around, but after finally looking ahead once more, she appeared much less focused on the central island. As for Patent, he was standing on a northern podium, with Sapphire to his right and Amethyst to his left. It was noted on a later replay that Denim was looking towards Patent and appearing to attempt eye contact with him, but Patent simply looked ahead towards the nearest axe that Amethyst seemed to be eyeing as well. Meanwhile, Optimo had been placed on a southeastern podium, and after looking around at the cave and other tributes, he turned back to the nearest axe. Yet as he looked to his right to see Lord, it became obvious to them both that they were eyeing the same axe. On the other side of the cave was Plush, who was on a northwestern podium, and breathing calmly at first. Although she appeared to notice that Sapphire was staring at her from the next podium for some of the countdown, she paid no attention, and alternated her focus between the nearest axe ahead of her and Scabble, who was stood just three podiums to her right, and he continued to look back towards her in a reassuring manner until the gong sounded. The crowds cheered in Snow Square, and some shouts of surprise were heard as one of the tributes was seen on the vertical camera to run away from the central platform and towards the nearest exit arch. This was later shown to be Dazzle, who had immediately run east without looking back, although as she sprinted through the next cave, she darted her gaze around at the lakes as she tried to avoid running straight into them. Meanwhile, Shamers had dived in from her western podium, and it soon became clear that she would be one of the first tributes to reach the central island. However, as the water became shallower, she appeared to panic when she noticed Rock was swimming slightly faster to her left, although she continued swimming as quickly as her arms could take her. Within the space of a second, Rock, 
Shamers and Patent became the first three tributes to stand up in the water when they neared the island, but as Shamers quickly waded east, she spotted a rock running ahead of her, across the island and towards the central platform. Shamers quickly turned in a southeastern direction and ran across the island, whilst Rock became the first tribute to grab an axe. He then turned and snarled to Shamers before throwing the axe towards her head. As for Patent, he had swum in very quickly from the north, before reaching the shallower water just before the island, which he ran through as he looked left to see Denim also sprinting towards the central platform. Amethyst held back from behind as she watched Denim grabbing an axe, whilst Patent briefly shuddered as he looked ahead to see the blade from Rock's axe flying off and slicing through Shamers' neck, which knocked her back into the water. However, Patent wasted no time and ran ahead to grab the nearest axe, as Denim shouted at him to duck. Patent crouched down with his axe and watched Rock picking up another axe and trying to attack Graf. Then he looked across to see Scabble ripping an axe from a corpse. Yet a split second after jolting around towards Denim, Peyton breathed out erratically before charging towards him with the axe. Meanwhile, Optimo had swum in from his southeastern podium that lay next to Lord. He swam very quickly, but it soon became clear that Lord was swimming slightly faster and was going to reach the central island before him. This did happen, but Lord slipped slightly as he reached the wet ground at the edge of the water. Optimo then grabbed onto the back of Lord's leg and pulled, which saw him fall over, and before he could get back up, Optimo grabbed the back of his head and smacked his forehead into the ground. Lord was now bleeding heavily, but Optimo sprinted past him and towards the central platform, whilst Denim threw an axe that flew straight past him and into the head of Opulenza, who fell back into the water in front of Scabble. Rubius and Eugenia quickly debated as to whether Denim had been aiming this axe at Optimo or Opulenza, until they noticed Peyton swinging his axe towards Denim on the other side of the platform. However, Denim narrowly avoided its swipe, before kicking Patent in the chest, which caused him to fall back onto an upturned axe and its blade lodged into the back of his head. As Patent fell back, Optimo was charging towards the central platform, from which he grabbed his own axe and narrowly avoided the swipe of Rock's second axe, before sprinting back towards Lord, who was desperately trying to get to his feet. Optimo smashed the blade of the axe across the back of Lord's neck, but as he turned to his left, he gasped upon seeing Sapphire attacking Plush near the western edge of the dry ground. Plush and Scabble had swum in from the west after the gong sounded. Scabble swam slightly faster, and he seemed intent on attacking Graf, who had been swimming to his right. Yet as he looked up to see Sharmers falling back into the lake, he gasped and appeared worried about grabbing an axe. Scabble then turned left and seemed to be desperately looking for Plush, until he noticed her legs kicking above the water's surface, whilst her head was held beneath by Sapphire. Scabble looked ready to run towards her, until Opulenza suddenly fell into the water in front of him, with an axe sticking out of her head. Scabble shuddered, and appeared unsure for a split second, before pulling the axe from Opulenza's head, and launching it towards Sapphire, which smacked into the side of her head, and knocked her into the water, whilst Plush quickly resurfaced and gasped for breath. However, as Scabble darted through the water towards Plush, he noticed that Rock was looking towards Sapphire's floating corpse, and glaring in anger. Rock was now stood upon the central platform, whilst most other tributes were still fighting between themselves on the surrounding island. He grabbed the only untouched axe, and readied it to throw towards Scabble, who was now trying to shield Plush. After stabbing Lord in the chest, Optimo turned to see Rock, who was about to throw his axe towards Scabble. However, just before Rock was about to release the axe, Optimo sprinted up behind, and forcefully pushed him off the platform, which also caused the axe to fly off onto the nearby ground. Scabble was clearly relieved, whilst Plush only just appeared to have gathered her breath. Optimo then snatched a stray axe that lay nearby, before charging west through the water towards Scabble and Plush. Yet it seemed that Optimo was not intending to attack either Scabble or Plush, and as Scabble pulled the axe from Sapphire's head, Optimo reached them and appeared to gesture towards the arch ahead. The trio then swam west until they reached the shallower ground by the podiums, whilst Rock and Racina guarded the central island with the remaining axes, and Miracle thrust the axe further into the head of Patent, whose hands were still shaking. Meanwhile, Dazzle had immediately run east from the Cornucopia Cave, and as most of the other tributes were beginning to flee from this cave, she was already sprinting along the narrow paths that lay between the lakes and the surrounding caves, while seemingly trying to not fall into these lakes. For the next five minutes, Dazzle continued to sprint east, but as she entered the middle zone of the arena, she appeared to slow down and appreciate the wider paths between the smaller lakes. 
She also looked up and marvelled at the array of luminous diamonds on the ceiling, but after hearing shouts echoing through the caves behind her, she started to run ahead once more. After three more minutes, Dazzle ran into a cave of the outer zone, before tripping over a rock and stumbling into a shallow lake. Rubius then mimicked the comedic sound that was used in the Bunga games whenever one of the Brit Toots was pushed into a sad ball or hit by a scratchy stick. This clearly amused Eugenia and many viewers in Snow Square, but as the focus returned to Dazzle, she did not appear to be injured and simply rested within a cluster of rocks by the side of this lake, from which she routinely looked around for the next few minutes until five cannons sounded. Compared to many other tributes, Dazzle seemed relatively relaxed at this time, and she breathed in a controlled manner as she nestled within these rocks. However, after a few minutes, she began to cough slightly, and it appeared that she needed water. She looked into the water of the nearby lake, but seemed apprehensive, and Eugenia stated that she doubted any tributes would want to risk drinking this water, especially at such an early point within the games. Many viewers in Snow Square then voiced their confusion as Dazzle grabbed one of the smaller diamond rocks by her feet before tapping it lightly against the floor, but wincing at the sound that was created. Eugenia asked what the Scotland Dazzle was doing, but after a few firmer taps, another camera showed that a few of the diamonds attached to this rock had come loose, and she held them up to the light that was coming in from the eastern side of the cave, before grinning as she noticed their bright colours. Dazzle carefully leaned towards the lake and dropped these diamonds onto its surface. She counted to five on her fingers, and as the diamonds began to sink into the water, she smiled in excitement, before placing her hand into the lake and lapping up some of its water. Many viewers did not know what Dazzle had just done to check the water's purity, and Eugenia asked Rubius, but he replied that it must be thanks to a special kind of diamond that she knew could help. He elaborated that certain diamonds would float in different kinds of water for various amounts of time, and that Dazzle must have used her knowledge of this subject to determine that the water was pure. She was in fact the only tribute to drink from this water for at least another hour, but after appearing to have satisfied her thirst, she carefully headed to the south and slightly further east, towards the outer zone of the arena. Dazzle continued through several more caves, but after entering a cold, dry cave and seeming worried about her surroundings, she quickly hid herself within another cluster of rocks for the next few minutes, whilst gripping on firmly to one of the larger rocks. After realising that there were no other tributes in the vicinity, Dazzle slowly sat up and used one of the diamonds to smack against this larger rock. Eugenia seemed confused once more and asked why she was doing this, to which Rubius replied that he had no idea. Dazzle appeared to be using as much strength as she had to quietly hit this rock, but after a few minutes she began to smile. Then upon seeing parts of the rock falling apart and breaking into a set of smaller rocks, she grinned and let out an excited squeal before placing most of them in her pocket and holding the others at the ready. Meanwhile, on the other side of the arena, Plush, Scabble and Optimo had sprinted west from the Cornucopia Cave with two axes between them that were being carried by Scabble and Optimo. As they ran through the next cave to the Cornucopia, Plush thanked Optimo for tackling Rock and hence most likely saving her from being hit by his axe, but Optimo simply said that this was no problem before looking around once more as they ran and reminding both Plush and Scabble that they needed to hurry. As the trio continued through more caves to the west, Optimo appeared to sense pain in his right foot, with the later replay showing that he had fallen on this part of his body during the bloodbath when he tackled Rock. This therefore caused him to start limping as he ran, and whilst Plush and Scabble seemed to be having some trouble navigating between the lakes, Optimo was finding this task more difficult, occasionally slipping his legs into some lakes, but running ahead nonetheless. Within seconds of entering the middle zone, Optimo's entire right leg slipped into the side of a lake, and Scabble insisted on helping, by putting Optimo's arm over his shoulder, to which he initially objected, but as he realised that this was making movement easier, he accepted Scabble's help, and the trio headed west into the middle zone. For the next two minutes, they slowly continued through these caves, and the five cannons sounded, but Optimo soon became distracted by the myriad of lights shining from the rocks around them, and after looking back and appearing certain that nobody was close behind, he asked if they could stop, to which Plush and Scabble seemed happy to agree. While Scabble checked on Plush, Optimo stretched his ankle and examined these rocks. He held up a rock and looked carefully at its diamonds, before incorrectly guessing what kind they were, although his estimate regarding their sale value was later shown to be surprisingly accurate. Once Plush had confirmed that she was feeling fine, Scabble spotted a nearby rock, which had already fallen from the roof and shattered into smaller pieces. 
He took his axe and gently cracked one of these pieces, which released several tainted diamonds as they fell apart. After marvelling at these diamonds, he took one that contained a red glow, before turning around and handing it to Plush, then stating that he knew red was her favourite colour. Plush had seemed slightly dazed, but she smiled and accepted the diamond, amidst sympathetic sounds of admiration in Snow Square, whilst Rubius pretended to vomit and Eugenia laughed. Optimo glanced at this exchange with a bemused expression, and Plush looked like she was about to say something to Scabble, but Optimo suddenly shushed her and pointed to the east, before mouthing that he thought he heard something. Although this was later shown to only be a stray rock falling from the roof of a cave into a lake below, Plush quickly nodded, and Scabble grabbed his axe. Then the trio continued west. They spent the next five minutes travelling onwards, until they reached the outer zone, at which point Scabble stopped, and looked around the cave they had just entered. Plush and Optimo looked back, and the former asked if he was alright, to which he replied that he was, and that this seemed like a sensible hiding place. After a brief inspection of this cave, Plush and Optimo agreed, and the trio rested within a cluster of rocks that lay next to the eastern arch of the cave. Optimo and Scabble both held their axes at the ready during this time, whilst Plush looked into a small lake by this cluster, and quietly pondered aloud if its water was safe to drink. After having broken the large rock into several smaller rocks, Dazzle stood up and practised walking around with them in her pockets for the next few minutes, which seemed relatively comfortable. She then took one out and appeared ready to throw it against a rut on the wall, until suddenly looking around and appearing annoyed, whilst Rubius stated that target practice would not be a wise idea in this sort of arena. Yet just as Dazzle looked at a nearby lake and seemed ready to aim for a specific spot on its surface, a shout and scream suddenly echoed from the southeast of her position, and she gasped before throwing herself to the ground. Dazzle appeared to be in two minds as to how to react as the shouting continued, but she grabbed a rock from her pocket in each hand, before running to the sudden entrance to this cave and peering out from behind its adjacent wall, as jeers began to sound along with the shouting. Dazzle quickly looked around this cave, and upon noticing that there was nobody within, she sprinted south until she had reached the southern arch to the next cave. The sound of other tributes appeared to stop, and she threw herself behind the wall next to this arch, and looked left into the cave to see a light hole coming down from the roof by the eastern wall that lay close to the perimeter. Yet as Dazzle squinted towards the light that was coming through this hole, she gasped as Denim ran through the opposite arch to this cave. She threw herself back around the side of the wall, and very carefully peeked out as Denim rapidly climbed the rocks beneath the light hole. Dazzle seemed surprised as he slowly disappeared up this wall, but she held her breath as Rock and Amethyst suddenly chased into this cave after Denim, and jeered at him as they ran towards the light hole that they could see him climbing. For the next few minutes, Dazzle appeared tempted to run, but unable to look away from Rock and Amethyst, who were stood beneath the light hole in which Denim was climbing. The pair continued to jeer, and Amethyst shouted a range of taunts at him, whilst Rock held his axe at the ready, then Amethyst jokingly reminded him to watch his footing. Viewers in Snow Square were clearly excited, but after a minute of climbing, Denim had still not fallen. Whilst Rock proceeded to grab his axe and look ready to climb up after Denim, Rosina looked around this cave and narrowly avoided spotting Dazzle, who quickly darted her head back behind the wall next to the arch where she was hiding. Eugenia had been shouting at Dazzle to flee, but Rosina did not appear to notice her. Yet this close call appeared to panic Dazzle, and she turned to run west into the next cave before alternating between the next cave to the north, then to the west, until Denim's cannon sounded a few minutes later. It was shown that he had continued to climb up the light hole, before inadvertently touching the arena's ceiling perimeter, which knocked him back to the ground below, where he was stabbed by rock. After hearing this cannon, Dazzle stopped running, and she lapped up some water from a nearby lake, before continuing in a northwestern direction for the next five minutes, until she reached a small cave in the northeastern middle zone, where she rested within a cluster of extremely bright rocks. As for Optimo, Plush and Scabble, they had been in the same cave of the western outer zone, where they continued to hold guard with their axes, whilst quietly discussing their lives in District 1. After spending 20 minutes sharing what they knew of the other tributes, Optimo asked Plush and Scabble how long they had been in a relationship, but to the surprise of Optimo and even Eugenia, Scabble responded that they were not together before these games. Plush then explained that they had been friends for several years, but were never single at the same time since they met, which stopped them from being together. However, Scabble added that he had broken up with his girlfriend the previous week, and that seeing as he and Plush were placed together, they decided to use the opportunity. 
Scammell grinned as he looked at Plush, and she added that there was no point in wasted opportunities. Optimo looked pensively towards the couple as Plush ended this sentence, and Scabble asked if he had anyone back home, to which he shook his head and looked away, stating that his mother did not want him to become distracted. Plush looked at Optimo with curiosity and asked what he meant, but he smiled and gestured to the cave around him. Both Plush and Scabble seemed more confused by this response, but just as Scabble asked what this meant, Horn of Plenty echoed through the caves, and the trio looked around in surprise. The roof of the cave suddenly lit up, and the portraits of Sapphire Jones, aged 18, Shamers Angstrom, aged 18, Lord Harrison, aged 17, Opulenza Rivalta, aged 18, Denim Townsend, aged 18, and Peyton Carter, aged 17, were all shown. Then the cave's roof suddenly became dark again, which meant that ten tributes now remained. Dazzle watched the portraits of the fallen tributes as she remained hidden in the cave of the northeastern middle zone. She seemed to count to herself and look around, as if she was trying to establish where the other tributes may be. Yet after almost ten minutes, she suddenly stopped and appeared to hear a noise coming from the north. Dazzle crept towards the northern arch of this cave and carefully peeked her head around the wall, before looking into the next cave beyond, where she appeared able to see Graf holding out an axe and looking behind some rocks whilst Bounty kept watch within the centre of this cave. After almost two minutes, Bounty and Graf briskly moved on north to the next cave, and as their backs turned, Dazzle quickly darted north through the arch to the next cave, before running towards the wall next to this cave's northern arch, so that Bounty and Graf would not be able to see her if they turned around. This pattern continued for the next ten minutes, during which time Dazzle purposely left a cave between herself and Bounty and Graf as they travelled north. Approximately ten minutes later, Dazzle was hiding within a hollow cave that the pair had passed through just a few minutes prior, and she remained gripped to the wall, next to a small lake by the northern arch. However, a cannon then sounded, and this made Dazzle jump in fright. This also caused her leg to slip into the nearest lake, and the resulting splashing sound was heard by Bounty and Graf. They quickly jolted around to face this noise, but Dazzle remained hidden behind the wall that lay next to this arch. She appeared to worry, before sprinting to this cave's eastern arch, then towards the light that she could most likely see coming in from the light holes at the edge of the arena, whilst Bounty and Graf were now heading south, towards the cave where Dazzle had just been hiding. Dazzle reached this outer cave within a minute, but as she entered through its arch, Graf reached the cave where she had slipped her leg into the lake, and he looked through the eastern arch, to see the outline of Dazzle in the distance. He quickly pointed this out to Bounty, and this sound alerted Dazzle, Graf then charged towards her with his axe in hand, and Bounty quickly followed, whilst Dazzle sprinted through the cave towards a light hole that lay just metres from the perimeter. Graf and Bounty continued northeast into the next cave, and Dazzle rapidly climbed the rocky wall at the side of this light hole. When the pair passed into this cave, she was seen to be nearing the ceiling's perimeter, although as she appeared to hear an electronic whirring, she stopped climbing and gripped onto the rock. Graf reached the bottom of the light hole first, and raised his axe slightly in amusement as he watched Dazzle above him. Bounty then caught up with Graf and looked up at Dazzle, then joked that it would be practical for her to come down and fight them. Rubius stated that it would indeed be difficult for Bounty or Graf to climb the wall of the light hole with an axe in hand, whilst Bounty whispered to Graf and Dazzle continued to grip onto the rocks, before telling Graf to come up and fight her. This appeared to annoy him slightly, but the viewers in Snow Square cheered as he breathed out in exasperation and began climbing. Bounty watched carefully, and gave Graf advice about which rock to grip onto next, but he did not seem to be taking her advice. This task was also clearly shifting his focus from Dazzle, who was very carefully removing one of the rocks from her pocket. She called down to Graf, who looked up, and she dropped one of the rocks, which hit his nose with a loud thudding sound. Rubius laughed as Graf immediately yelped in pain and let go of the rock, which saw him fall two metres down this wall and onto the ground below, where he scraped his knee. Bounty asked to check Graf's nose, but he refused and angrily stomped back to the rocky wall, before snarling up at Dazzle and muttering that he was going to kill her. However, just as she looked ready to climb the wall, she held out another rock and said that she would drop it on him as well, adding that they should leave her alone whilst they had the chance. Graf breathed out in anger and took his hands away from the wall, then looked up at Dazzle, who was still gripping onto this rock. He shouted that she could not hold on forever, before turning back to Bounty 
and saying that they would wait here until she fell. Bounty nodded in agreement, and she and Graf rested for a few minutes, whilst Dazzle appeared to be frantically thinking about how she could escape the situation. Yet just as Dazzle readjusted her grip once more, the ground suddenly began shaking beneath, at first minorly, then violently, until rocks were falling from the roof of the cave, and Bounty and Graf shouted in terror when they were almost hit. During this time, Plush, Scabble, and Optimo had remained within a rocky alcove near the entrance of the cave in the western side of the outer zone. They quietly discussed where the other tributes could be, but after five minutes, Plush suddenly shushed Scabble and Optimo, before quietly pointing towards the nearby arch. The boys looked in the direction that Plush had pointed, and she very quietly whispered that she had heard footsteps. Viewers could see that this trio were indeed being approached by other tributes, and Scabble quietly picked up his axe, whilst turning away towards the southern arch to the next cave. However, Optimo very quietly whispered that they should not be too scared to fight, and mouthed that they could ambush these tributes from behind these rocks. As Optimo picked up his axe and lay down next to the nearest rock, Plush seemed worried and looked ready to run, but Scabble gripped onto his axe as well and nodded to her in reassurance, before scurrying up to the wall next to the arch, with his axe held firmly in his hands. However, no further sound was heard for the next two minutes, as this trio remained still, and Plush eventually looked up from behind a rock, then pointed towards the arch in confusion. Scabble also seemed unsure, and very slowly moved his head around the side of the wall, until it was grazed by the swipe of an axe's blade. Plush yelped as Scabble jolted back and pulled up his own axe. However, Racina bolted around the side of the wall and slashed her axe towards that of Scabble, which caused both of their blades to fly off and hit the nearby ground, whilst Miracle ran around the side of the wall towards Scabble. Upon quickly realising that her axe was missing a blade, and that Optimo was now running towards her, Racina panicked and ran back through the arch, whilst Miracle tackled Scabble to the ground, which knocked his head against a rock and appeared to render him unconscious. Optimo chased Rosina through the next cave to the east, and Plush grabbed another rock, which he tried to smack against Miracle's face, although he managed to grab her by the arm before tripping her back to the ground. Miracle got on top of Plush and throttled her neck. She tried to push his arms away, but his strength was no match for hers, and she soon began squealing very quietly in pain. Whilst Plush's supporters cheered at her to fight back, Scabble slowly woke up against the rock behind Miracle, he looked back towards Plush being strangled, then around again to see the detached blade of one of the axes, which he started to crawl towards. As Scabble reached this blade, a cannon sounded, and he jerked around to look at Plush once more, but breathed a brief sigh of relief as he saw her toes still moving in a frenzy beneath Miracle's legs. Scabble then shouted Miracle's name, and as he turned around, Scabble threw the axe's blade. Unfortunately for Scabble, Miracle ducked down and from an apparent impulse, he covered his head with his right hand, but this allowed Plush to free her left hand, and she snatched a nearby piece of rock that she smacked into Miracle's mouth. He immediately roared in pain as blood formed between his teeth, two of which fell out, and Plush punched his face once more. As more teeth fell from Miracle's mouth, he shouted something unintelligible, and began to smack Plush's head against the ground. Yet after looking around in a panic, Scabble suddenly noticed the sharp end of the nearby axe's broken shaft, which lay just metres to his right, and he quickly scurried over to grab it. Plush began to scream as her head was smacked into the ground again by Miracle, but Scabble lunged forwards with the axe's shaft and thrust it into the back of Miracle's head, with enough force that it pierced his skull, and he almost immediately stopped moving, with his cannon sounding seconds later. Scabble crawled forwards as Miracle fell forwards onto Plush, and she breathed out in disgust as she wriggled out from beneath him. Scabble then helped Plush move out from under Miracle, and he held her in his arms as she felt the back of her head in pain. However, as they heard footsteps approaching through the adjacent cave, Scabble quickly pulled the axe shaft from the back of Miracle's head, and Plush breathed out in a panicked manner. Meanwhile, viewers had seen Optimo chasing east after Racina, who was now unarmed. Optimo still held his axe, but he appeared unwilling to throw it at Racina when she was still a sizable distance ahead of him. However, after running through four more caves, Optimo finally caught up with Rosina, and she stood directly in front of a cave's wall as he moved towards her with his axe. Optimo appeared ready to throw it, when Rosina grinned and laughed. He breathed out in annoyance and asked what was so amusing, and with a grin she responded, having a mare for a parent was never going to help you in here. Optimo appeared unbothered and held up his axe once more, but Rosina suddenly added, 
didn't help your sister, did it? Optimus snarled as Rosina cackled, coming third to a blockhead and a lunatic was hilarious, and he lunged his axe towards her. Rosina quickly ducked to the ground, but Capital viewers gasped as Optimo surprisingly kept hold of the axe. Rosina began to scurry to her feet, but Optimo threw the axe for real this time, and it flew across her neck, which saw her head fall to one side, whilst the rest of her body fell to the other. Optimo breathed out in relief, and he walked forwards to retrieve the axe as Rosina's cannon sounded. Respectful applause followed in Snow Square for Rosina's attempt to survive, and Rubia stated that she had nearly pulled it off. Meanwhile, Optimo had almost re-entered the cave where Scabble and Plush were recovering from their fight with Miracle. They quickly prepared themselves as his footsteps approached, but when Optimo came into view around the side of the arch, they both breathed out in relief and held each other. Plush then kissed Scabble, and he said that he had always loved her, to which he smiled and held on to him. Laughter followed in Snow Square as Optimo stood on his own and awkwardly watched the couple, whilst Eugenia joked, we've all been there. For the next ten minutes, Plush and Scabble's pain gradually appeared to subside, and as Plush stretched her neck and Plush relaxed, Optimo kept watch. However, these moments of peace suddenly ended when the ground started shaking and diamonds fell from the roof. At this exact moment on the eastern side of the arena, Dazzle was gripping on very tightly to the rocky wall at the side of the light hole where she had escaped from Bounty and Graf, whilst the ground and the wall itself continued to shake violently around her. She was heard to gasp for breath, but maintained her grip and narrowly avoided falling to the ground below, although Graf shouted as several rocks fell from this wall and hit his legs. The ground stopped shaking after almost three minutes, and Dazzle let out an exhausted sigh of relief as she continued to grip onto the wall, and Bounty tried to help Graf, who had fallen to his knees in pain. Dazzle looked down and noticed that Bounty was now stood with her back to the wall, and trying to rip off a piece of her light suit, so that it could be used as a bandage for a cut sustained by Graf, who was lying on the nearby ground a few metres away from her with his axe. Dazzle pulled another rock from her pocket, before very carefully loosening her grip and dropping down from this wall, then running towards Bounty, who glanced up and jumped in surprise. However, Dazzle had already jumped forwards, and she smacked this rock into the side of Bounty's head. Graf quickly jumped to his feet and swung his axe towards Dazzle as she approached, but she ducked back and avoided the blade, then threw another rock at Graf's head with such force that he fell back and hit his head against a larger rock, which caused him to drop the axe. Graf winced in pain and still tried to get to his feet, but Dazzle ran towards the axe and grabbed its handle. He briefly held up his hands and begged for mercy, but she smacked its blade through his neck and the cannon sounded before his head had hit the floor. Dazzle looked back to see Bounty, who was hardly moving. She approached Bounty and brought down the axe onto her head, and after her cannon sounded, Dazzle looked around pensively. As the death claw protruded from the cave ceiling and moved in to collect these bodies, she headed southwest towards the center of the arena for the next few minutes, whilst carefully looking into each cave before she entered. After ten minutes, Dazzle entered the northeastern inner zone, and when Horn and Plenty began to play, she looked up to the roof of this cave. The portraits of Rosina Mentis, aged 18, Miracle Rosinski, aged 18, Bounty Backrock, aged 18, and Graf Ferens, aged 17, were all shown, which left only six tributes remaining. Rock Fortescue, aged 18, Optimo Braun, aged 18, Amethyst Asai, aged 17, Plush Malone, aged 17, Scabble Forex, aged 18, and Dazzle Mortello aged 18. Meanwhile, in a cave on the western side of the arena's outer zone, Optimo, Scabble and Plush panicked as some diamonds and then a few larger rocks fell from the roof. Plush and Scabble cowered within some of the rocks where they had been resting, but after a much larger rock fell between them, Scabble quickly yanked Plush by the hand and pulled her towards the nearby arch, in which, surprisingly, no rocks or even diamonds had fallen. However, Optimo yelped when a rock hit his shoulder, as he spotted Plush and Scabble running towards the arch, he was almost hit by another rock, and so he quickly jumped up and ran ahead, threw some falling diamonds that scratched against his face, towards a nearby lake that was small but deep. While Scabble held Plush beneath the arch, Optimo ran forwards and was almost hit by an even larger rock as he dived into this lake. The underwater camera showed him levitating about a metre below the water's surface as diamonds and larger rocks fell into this lake, but it was noticed that after entering the water, these rocks fell much slower, and therefore caused less damage when they touched Optimo within the water below. In fact, for the remaining minute of this earthquake, rocks only hit his left hand and right shin, 
which did not seem to affect him too badly. Optimo then appeared to run out of breath and quickly came up to the surface, before gasping for breath and resubmerging himself. Yet at this time, the earthquake was easing, and so he came back up to the surface soon after. Within 15 seconds, the ground had completely stopped shaking, and Scabble sprinted over to help Optimo from the lake, whilst Plush gingerly walked back out from beneath the arch. Scabble then kept watch with his axe, and Plush checked on Optimo's hand and shin, as well as the scratches on his face, the latter of which were now bleeding. However, all three tributes, especially Optimo, appeared cautious after hearing the two cannons that sounded over the next two minutes. Scabble therefore roamed around this cave, and looked through each of the arches, presumably for any tributes, whilst Plush applied pressure on top to most facial scars. Over the next 15 minutes, the bleeding from these scars gradually ceased, and the trio remained relatively quiet until Plush casually remarked that she would have never volunteered if she had known about these earthquakes. This surprising comment was met with jeers and Snow Square, and Rubius casually remarked, nothing like this happened in District 2's games. Yet as Scabble returned to sit with them, Optimo stated that they were in the arena now, and that it was too late to back away from what needs to be done. Scabble sat nearby, and Optimo spoke about how he refused to die in these caves, and that his family would never forgive him if he gave up on victory. However, it was noticed that whilst Optimo was speaking, Scabble was watching him with a very pensive expression. As Optimo looked at the diamonds in the roof above, and appeared to enter an almost trance-like state, he continued to speak about his family's expectations. Scabble even looked up towards Plush, and mind cutting his own neck, but she scratched her right ear, then looked straight back to Optimo. Soon after he finished speaking, Horn of Plenty played, and the portraits of the four recently fallen tributes were shown. As Optimo continued to look up at the roof, and Plush looked ahead in her daze, Scabble suggested that as there were not many others left, they should head back towards the cornucopia. Neither Plush nor Scabble appeared to have any issues with this plan, and so they got to their feet, and the trio quietly proceeded east. Meanwhile, Dazzle was travelling southwest through the northeastern inner zone. Whenever she entered a new cave, she very carefully looked through its arch and slowly entered, whilst holding the axe that she had just acquired from Graf. Dazzle appeared to be noticing more and more lakes as she neared the cornucopia, and so she was deftly choosing her path between them as well. She entered the anti-penultimate cave before the cornucopia, and through the relative darkness, she seemed to notice the glistening from the cornucopia cave ahead. Dazzle lost her balance when she neared the edge of this cave, and she narrowly avoided slipping into one of the adjacent lakes, but she quickly regained her balance and scurried through the arch into the next cave ahead. Amethyst suddenly jumped out from the wall on the right of this arch, then swiped her axe towards Dazzle's neck, and it came so close to hitting her that it sliced through one of her blonde plaits. Dazzle jumped and quickly held up her own axe, before thrusting it towards Amethyst, who jumped back, and the axe narrowly avoided hitting her chest. The blade then smacked into the wall instead, which caused it to detach from the axe's shaft. When Amethyst had jumped back, she narrowly avoided slipping into a lake behind her, but Dazzle was now only in possession of her axe's shaft. She therefore smacked it around the side of Amethyst's head with as much force as she appeared to possess. This caused Amethyst to yelp in pain and fall back into the lake behind her, whilst Dazzle sprinted in a northeastern direction towards the arch that led into the next cave to the north. Amethyst waded out of the lake and held her head in pain to see Dazzle entering the cave to the north. She then looked back to see Amethyst just 50 metres away and turning towards Dazzle with her axe at the ready. Amethyst cursed and sprinted towards the arch, whilst Dazzle jumped behind the adjacent wall. As Amethyst ran nearer, viewers cheered to see Dazzle rapidly scaling this wall, despite its rough terrain having proved difficult for other tributes to climb. She quickly reached over to her right, and managed to grip onto a rock that jutted out just above the arch's entrance. Amethyst then ran into this cave, and swung her axe into the wall next to which Dazzle had been hiding. Yet Dazzle had already climbed above this point, and Amethyst briefly looked at this wall in bewilderment, before looking up to see Dazzle throwing a rock at her head. Amethyst immediately screamed in pain as the rock hit her head, and she fell back, hitting her head on another rock as she did so. She loudly cursed Dazzle and tried to get up, but just as Dazzle appeared ready to throw another rock, a loud squeaking sound could be heard approaching from the cornucopia, and both girls suddenly became still. A minute earlier, Viewers in Snow Square had cheered with excitement when several mischiefs of rats had been released from the cornucopia, including the mischief that was now scurrying straight towards the girls. Amethyst shuddered as the rats' squeaking intensified, 
and she tried to get up from the ground, but it was clear that she was in immense pain. Whilst Dazzle gripped onto the rocks of this wall with all the strength that she appeared to have remaining. Viewers saw that the rats had just entered this cave and were now scurrying along the paths between the lakes towards the girls. Amethyst finally managed to sit up and she crawled towards her axe, but Dazzle readied another rock from her pocket and shouted at Amethyst to not hit her with the axe. However, Amethyst ignored Dazzle and picked up the axe before getting to her feet and slowly pulling it back. Yet before Amethyst could release it, Dazzle threw a final rock, which hit Amethyst's chest and knocked her to the ground, as the mischief of rats finally arrived on this side of the cave. For the next few minutes, Dazzle desperately held on to the rocky wall, whilst grimacing in disgust and pain, as Amethyst was bitten by this mischief of rats, amidst screams that grew louder and louder until her cannon eventually sounded. Although Amethyst's body was quickly removed by the Deathclaw, and the mischief of rats soon continued moving northeast from the cornucopia, Dazzle remained gripped to this wall, seemingly not daring to move. Another cannon then sounded, and after very slowly descending from the wall and looking carefully at the ground around her, Dazzle finally sat down on the ground again. Yet when one more cannon sounded, an announcement began, and she jumped up in anticipation. During this time, Plush, Scabble and Optimo had continued east through the western middle zone. After five minutes, Plush suggested taking a brief rest in a cave that contained many larger diamond rocks, and the trio did this, whilst discussing the potential locations of the remaining tributes. Yet as Scabble and Optimo were quietly debating Dazzle's location, Plush began to hear screams echoing through the caves to the east, and she quickly shushed the boys. They all listened carefully as these screams became louder and more gruesome, whilst Optimo gripped onto his axe. Scabble turned to Plush and suggested moving further from these screams, but it was then that she pointed to movement through the arch to the east and let out a yelp as she realised that something was moving towards them. Plush shouted that these were rats, and she grabbed Scabble by the hand and practically dragged him towards some of the higher rocks on the northern side of this cave, although as he realised that these were indeed rats coming towards them, he waved the shaft of the axe behind him and ran even faster than Plush towards these rocks. Optimo took a while to realise what was happening, but as the rats passed through the arch ahead of him and into this cave, he turned and sprinted towards these rocks after Scabble and Plush. He jumped up onto the highest rocks next to Scabble, and the trio watched as the rats scurried towards these rocks. The rats continued to move around the base of these rocks, and even appeared to try climbing them, but to no avail. During this time, Scabble diligently watched the rats, Plush looked away in disgust, and Optimo gripped onto his axe with both hands. After almost two minutes, a cannon sounded, and this made Plush jump, but she remained sat atop her rock, and within ten seconds, the mischief of rats was continuing west, away from the cornucopia. Once they had passed through the cave, the trio slowly got down from the rocks, and they appeared relieved to have avoided any further contact with these rats. Yet Plush was clearly rather shaken, and Scabble spent time reassuring her that they had gone. Plush began to panic, and said that she wished she had never volunteered. However, Scabble held Plush in his arms, then made her breathe and repeat that she could win, which triggered more jeers from the audience, and Rubia said that he hoped she would die next. Optimo watched the pair curiously from the other side of the rocks, and after some hesitation, Plush did as Scabble asked, and repeated that she could win. She seemed to believe this idea the more she repeated it, and Scabble smiled, whilst her utterings of I can win morphed into I will win, and then we will win. The latter of which she said with even more conviction as she gripped onto Scabble's hands with a firmer grip. During this time, Optimo was gripping his axe and looking out towards the rest of the cave, presumably for any further dangers. Yet as Plush continued talking and indicating that she wanted herself and Scabble to win, Optimo gradually turned around and watched her with a dubious expression. Scabble gradually looked up and noticed Optimo eyeing them intently. Then as Scabble briefly smiled back, another camera showed him reaching a hand behind himself for the shaft of his axe. Optimo jumped down from the rock and launched his axe into Scabble's head, which knocked him back onto the ground below and his cannon sounded as Plush screamed in horror. She looked up and cried as she shouted obscenities at Optimo, many of which were unintelligible, although she appeared to be asking what he had done. He quickly replied that he had to win, and that he did not want to hurt her, but Plush gasped in horror, before turning to the axe and whimpering as she tried to pull it from Scabble's head. Optimo shouted at Plush to stop, but she continued pulling on the axe and swearing at him. Optimo ran around the rocks, then towards Plush, 
and she screamed as she finally managed to pull the axe from Scavel's head. Plush swung it in front of Optimo as he ran towards her, but she appeared to have done this too quickly, and as the blade swung down to her side, Optimo ran forwards and tackled her to the ground. Plush still tried to push Optimo off and grab the axe once more, but after a few seconds, he had gripped onto her neck, and he began to smack the back of her head against the ground. Plush screamed in pain, but whilst Optimo continued to growl that he had to win, she became quieter, until she hardly made a noise. Optimo then reached over and grabbed the axe, before standing up and slicing it through Plush's neck, which sounded her cannon just seconds later. Plush's death mustered many cheers in Snow Square, and a few seconds later, it was announced that Dazzle Mortello was the female victor of District 1's games, and that any tribute who caused her harm would have their tracker detonated. Upon hearing this, Dazzle gasped in surprise, and held on to the wall next to her as she appeared to realise what this meant, before sitting down against the ground and relaxing as she smiled. Optimo did not appear too phased by this fight, and he casually wiped the blood from his face as he heard this announcement. Yet as the Deathclaw collected Scabble and Plush's bodies from above, another announcement began. President Gaul congratulated Rock and Optimo for having become the final two male tributes, before stating that their trackers would detonate in five minutes, unless they were inside the Cornucopia Cave. Gaul then wished that the odds be in their favour, and ended his announcement. Due to an earlier disagreement, Rock had separated from Amethyst almost an hour earlier, and was now in the eastern outer zone, whilst Optimo was in the western middle zone. Both young men immediately sprinted towards the Cornucopia, and as they were shown on the split screen in Snow Square, flurries of cheers and shouts of support flowed amongst the citizens present. However, it came as a surprise to some that instead of resting, Dazzle also sprinted towards the Cornucopia, and within just one minute, she had reached this central cave, in which she quickly swam towards the central island and listened carefully, whilst looking around through each of the arches. Seconds later, Optimo sprinted through the western arch of the Cornucopia Cave with his axe held firmly at the ready. Upon noticing Dazzle, he quickly held the axe in front of himself, but after appearing to realise that she was not Rock, he stopped moving and asked if she knew where Rock was. Dazzle responded that she did not, and Optimo looked ready to run into the water between them, but Dazzle quickly added that she could help Optimo if he wanted. Optimo suddenly held back and asked what Dazzle meant, to which she replied that Rock was the highest scoring male tribute and would likely beat him in a fight. Optimo seemed slightly irked to hear this, but Dazzle quickly looked through each of the arches and continued that if they could come to an agreement, she would kill Rock for him. Viewers in Snow Square seemed as surprised by this surreal exchange as Optimo himself, but after appearing to quickly gather his thoughts, he asked what Dazzle had in mind. She asked if it was true that Optimo's mother was the mayor, and he nodded, then asked why. Dazzle said that she would like a monthly donation of the mayoral budget to go to her maternal grandparents, and Optimo seemed confused, but he asked how much, and she glanced around once more through each of the arches, before responding enough to stop them working. Optimo breathed out in exasperation as he looked around, then said that this was probably possible. Dazzle nodded, and added that she would also like her nephew, Nickel, to be given medical priority within a district's hospital for his broken back. Optimo appeared even more bewildered, and responded that he did not know if this was possible, but he would try. Dazzle then jolted around, and upon hearing movement through the eastern arch, she told Optimo that she could always help Rock instead. Optimo briefly pleaded with Dazzle, but added that if he was able to organise this, he wanted a confirmed alliance with her in the Grand Final. Rock appeared just two caves to the east, whilst Dazzle nodded and stated that they had a deal. Optimo proceeded to lower himself into the water behind the island, and many viewers in Snow Square were still laughing, gasping, or a mixture of these two actions following this unusual exchange. Eugenia voiced her admiration for Dazzle's bargaining skills, but Rubia said that this was the problem with District 1 brats. As Rock ran through the final cave, he began to make eye contact with Dazzle, and after entering the lake of the Cornucopia Cave with his axe at the ready, he asked if she had seen Optimo. Dazzle shook her head, and watched as Rock waded through the water and looked around the cave for Optimo. He then looked through the northeastern arch and the northern arch, until Dazzle suddenly gasped and pointed back to the eastern arch, through which Rock had come. He jolted around, but as he squinted into this cave, Dazzle picked up her axe and threw it straight into the back of his head. Rock fell forwards into the water, and his cannon sounded, as Dazzle turned back to Optimo, who rose back up from the water to her west.
She stated that he owed her and winked. Then President Gaul announced that Optimo Braun was the male victor of District 1's games, amidst a range of cheers, jeers and applause in Snow Square. Following their victory, Optimo and Dazzle were collected from the arena and flown directly to Gaul Hospital, whilst the analysis of these games began. They were treated for the minor cuts and scars that they had encountered during the games, and although neither of the pair had received any major injuries, it was noted by Capital Medics that the scars Optimo had received from the Diamonds would likely be visible for a while. Only half an hour into the analysis, Eugenia suddenly diverted the action to an unplanned announcement that had just been set up in Mayor Braun in District 1. Braun sent her congratulations to both Optimo and Dazzle, before confirming that she would honour the agreement made by Optimo. Yet shortly after the announcement appeared to have terminated, some capital citizens claimed that Mayor Braun could be heard calling Dazzle a greedy cow. Dazzle's grandparents are reported to have been given a sizeable monthly income for the rest of their lives, whilst her nephew, Nicol Harrison, underwent surgery the next week that greatly facilitated his ability to walk. The next evening, with the Victor interviews, an Optimo and Dazzle came to the stage in a matching suit and gown respectively that were made from scarlet fabrics, whilst the lapels and hems were coated with hundreds of real diamonds and rubies. Optimo was interviewed first, and Eugenia praised him for his determination throughout the games, before analysing each of his kills. She also asked many questions about Optimo's alliance with Plush and Scabble, and he mentioned that he took no pleasure in killing them, but that throughout the games he was reminding himself that they would eventually try to kill him. Optimo also stated that towards the end of the games, it became clear that he needed to act first, as he needed to fulfil his purpose in life and take any measure to win, including making the deal with Dazzle, which was met with a mixture of cheers and controversial laughter, whilst Dazzle grinned towards the audience. Eugenia also announced that Optimo had become known as the Separator, for the way that he had not only separated the couple within the games, but also for how he had separated several opponents' heads from their shoulders. Laughter flowed through the audience, as Optimo simply nodded in a contented manner to this explanation. As for Dazzle, Eugenia commended her weaponry, stealth and intelligence throughout the games, and this was met with rampant applause and cheers from the audience. Eugenia also asked Dazzle why she had run away from the cornucopia at the start of the games, to which she responded that as soon as she saw that the weapons were axes, she guessed that the other tributes would do anything to stop her from accessing one, after having seen her talent displays that both featured axe throwing. Eugenia nodded in understanding, and Dazzle's kills were analysed, to the admiration of many viewers. It was then revealed that she had become known as Diamond Dazzle within the capital, due to her method of killing several other tributes with the Diamond Rocks. Eugenia added that nobody had expected these diamonds to be used this way, although it had caused much amusement for capital viewers, which was met with further cheers from the audience, and Dazzle smiled warmly towards them. However, despite the success of these games and the subsequent interviews, the next week saw a large rise in the cases of the unidentified strain of measles, with historians believing that the gatherings in public areas and indoor viewing parties may have been a leading cause in this increase of cases. Furthermore, many capital citizens, especially those who had contracted the virus, blamed President Gaul for his weakness in not having tried to recapture District 12 from the European powers, with a large number of citizens apparently believing that the district's medical expertise would have most likely led to the creation of a vaccine or a way to treat this virus more effectively. This even led to several protests throughout the capital over the next few days, which accelerated the spread of the virus, although most of these protests was fortunately ended with ease by the power of President Gull's forces. Yet just as order appeared to be restored within the capital, a technological virus was released, that affected many citizens' screens, computers, and other forms of technology. This caused the control of these devices to be transferred to an unknown party that was revealed many years later to be an undercover cell of Unidad, most of whom lived in the outskirts of the capital at the time. Fortunately for most capital citizens, their technological possessions remained unharmed and uncontrolled, but those of several senior commanders and leaders of Panem were in fact taken over and controlled remotely by the cell of Unidad. This data breach saw many confidential pictures, videos, and documents being released to the public, including several compromising pictures of President Gaul himself. 
However, the most harmful item released in this data breach was a recording that was played directly onto Capital TV the following evening. This recording was of a conversation that had taken place nine weeks earlier between President Gull and his personal psychologist, Tiberia Dovecote, who was believed by many historians to have been an undercover member of Unidad. This conversation appeared to occur during a session with Dovecote in Gull's private quarters that he had called for when he was extremely inebriated, following the after-party for the games of District 10. During this session, he spoke about an incident that was recently rolling through his mind that had taken place within weeks of the 72nd Hunger Games when he was just 17 years old. Gull recounted that he had been in a relationship with a young lady named Sinita Flynn for several months, but that she had ended their relationship within days of these games. One evening, he had gone out with friends to the nightclub Breen's, where he drank heavily and became inebriated, before seeing Sinita dancing nearby on the dance floor with another young lady named Flint Harrison, victor of the 72nd Hunger Games. Gull continued that the girls had left Breen's soon after, and that in his drunken stupor, he followed them back to Sinita's house. Yet when the girls were passing through Price Park, near the end of their journey, Gull ran up behind Sinita and asked why she was with Flint. This had apparently scared Sinita, and as she pushed Gaul away, a physical altercation ensued, in which he accidentally knocked her to the ground, and her head started bleeding. Flint tried to help Sinita, and she ordered Gaul to leave them alone. He stated that he did as Flint asked, but within a minute, she was shouting that Sinita was dead, and that she needed help. Gaul then recounted that he panicked, and because he did not want to be held accountable for Sinita's death, he ran back towards Flint. She saw him coming at the last moment and tried to flee, but he soon caught up with her before repeatedly smacking her head against the ground until she too had died. Gull continued that he hid the girls' bodies within a nearby borough of overgrown bushes before running back to his parents' house, where he begged for his father's help in disposing of these bodies. Dovecote then asked where these bodies were taken, but Gull replied that for his own protection, his father had never told him, and that he died a few years later, taking the secret with him to the grave. In the aftermath of this recording being released, several possible sites were excavated, but no remains were found, and therefore this case remains technically unsolved to this day, although most criminal historians of our land believe that Gaul's account of that night's events is truthful. However, immediately following this broadcast, outrage flowed throughout Panem. Although many capital citizens allegedly believed that some past presidents, such as President Snow and President Ravenstill, were responsible for various minor crimes throughout their presidencies, it was never considered that a president could have been responsible for such a well-known murder, especially that of two innocent young ladies, one of whom was a capital citizen, and the other of whom was a popular reigning victor of the Hunger Games. Following the release of this recording, the other items related to President Gull and his commanders, along with the worsening measles outbreak, the capital was in an undeniable state of chaos. Yet fortunately, morale amongst most citizens remained high, with many looking forward to the anticipated grand final that was due to begin the next Wednesday. And now, for a message from the Hunger Games Discord. Becoming a victor requires sacrifice. Overcoming mutations, natural disasters, and fellow competitors is detrimental for survival. Before Katniss and Peter, there were 73 others. On our server, there are currently 8, and the next one could be you. The interactive Discord Hunger Games server offers an experience unlike anything achievable through the use of online simulators. Once a month, Members are able to participate in a text-based D&D-style Hunger Games, developing survival skills, fighting in a rolling-based combat, and foraging for supplies are all feasible things within the massive custom design arena. Forge together in alliance, set up traps for the other tributes, play to the cameras, you can do anything you'd like within the bounds of the arena, and your actions will be reported to audiences along with artwork at the end of each day. For those who would rather spectate, the capital is always accepting visitors. Join the capital upper echelons 
and sponsor to your heart's content. Pull together funds for your favourite tribute, and bet money on who you believe will win. Our server lore and universe is built entirely by our members. Also available as roleplay, training academies, community events, and general discussion within our friendly, non-toxic environment. This is not a classic Hunger Games server where everything is randomised. This is a state-of-the-art community that will provide you everything you need and more from Zusan Collins' amazing series. Over the course of one year, our community has seen eight exciting games. Be there by August the 24th to sign up for games number nine and your chance to make history.